Hi, I'm Lucy and this is my Author Spotlight, which is a program where I spend some time each episode highlighting the works of one author. And for this episode, I am going to tell you about the novels and short story collection of Lan Samantha Chang. And the reason that I'm going to tell you about this author is that I recently finished this book called The Family Chow. And this just came out in February of 2022. And I had never heard of this author. She goes by Samantha Chang. And I really loved this book. It's sort of a takeoff on the brothers Karamazov, but it doesn't adhere to that specifically. There just are three brothers and they are sort of vying or competing for their father's attention. So Lan Samantha Chang is the author of two previous novels, All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, which was published in 2010, and Inheritance, which was published in 2004. Before that, she published a novella and short story collection called Hunger that was published in 1998. Her short stories have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Plowshares, and the Best American Short Stories. She's received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and the American Academy in Berlin. Chang is the director of the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. She lives with her husband and daughter in Iowa City, Iowa. So that last part there is part of the reason why I wanted to highlight Samantha Chang. I finished this book and I thought it was great and I wanted to learn more about the author and I realized that she had written things previously to this, but not only that, she is the director of the Iowa Writers Workshop. She's the first female director and she's the first Asian American director. And this is a workshop that a lot of writers graduate from whose names you would recognize. There's so much fiction and poetry that comes out of here that we read all the time. And so I thought it would be interesting to look at the works of the person who is running that program. Her novella and short story collection, Hunger, which was written in 1998, is a study of Chinese immigrants in America and their uh, struggle to adapt to a new life. The novella is called Hunger. That's the first story. It's about a married couple, Min and Tian. And Min stays at home. She's the wife while Tian explores his music career. He is a violinist. Uh, she doesn't realize when she marries him that that is essentially all that he cares about is his music career. And they have two daughters, and then he spends a lot of energy trying to mold his two daughters into the musician that he never really could become. He is passed over often for promotions within the music world. Tian has some trauma from his life in China before he came to America, and he is not really dealing with it, but it very much informs who he is. And that compounded with his failure to get a permanent job turns Tian into someone who is not kind to his wife and his daughters and essentially pushes his wife away and pushes his daughters beyond where they desire to go in the music world. A huge part of Tian not being able to get a job is anti-Asian racism. And his anger about this escalates and drives him to push his daughters perhaps even farther. When one of them can't live up to his expectations, he ends up really neglecting her and almost verbally abusing the other one in order to get her to succeed. This initial novella introduces themes that end up appearing in a lot of Chang's work, um, fathers and daughters, sisters, family in general, immigration, assimilation, and how much people hold on to from the past. When people immigrate, how much do they let go of the place where they came from? And how many generations does it take for a family to become completely assimilated? And then what do they lose in that experience? I learned in an interview with Chang that she is very interested in the passage of time as a lens for human experience. And this is another thing that appears in her novella, in her short stories, and in all of her novels that I read. The topic of immigration also brings up um, the ideas of alienation, of isolation, of communicating without having a language, uh, trying to communicate silently, and particularly the way that this falls on uh, Chinese immigrant women. 
There are wives in many of the stories who come from a traditional culture and are very deferential to their husbands. Uh, this form of submission for them often ends in a resentment. The husbands in these stories tend to be stern and remote and bitter about the unfulfillment they experience in their lives. Many of these stories and two of the novels talk about American-born children who struggle between two cultures, in this case Chinese and American cultures. In many of the stories, those children are daughters. In the family Chow, those children are sons. And this causes these children to often become angry, resentful, and rebellious. While the stories in this collection deal a lot with the immigrant experience once it has happened, Chang's novel, Inheritance, which she wrote in 2004, takes place in China before the immigrant experience. There is an immigration part of it, but that does not happen until the end of the book. The book takes place in China in the 40s, and it's a very turbulent time. Um, Japan is invading. There's a push to leave China to go to Taiwan, and there are families that are sort of caught between living in China and Taiwan. The book starts out with a story of two sisters and it starts in the middle of the story. What's very interesting about Inheritance is it is actually narrated from the point of view of a girl named Hong who is the daughter of one of the sisters that the story starts from. So we are getting a narrator who only knows her part of the story until the end of the book. The other parts, her mother's growing up and her mother's parents and her aunt's life in China and her father and uncle's life in China, she has to learn from what she hears and from what she can find out on her own. And then what she can imagine beyond that by using the political and historical context that her family was living in. So as well as being two sisters, there are also two brothers in this story. Uh, one of the brothers ends up marrying one of the sisters and the two brothers are on opposite sides of a political divide which is a very big point of conflict in this story the two sisters are also very different um the older one always wants to do what's right the younger one is more inclined to follow her feelings regardless of the outcome and so this sibling conflict plays a large role in the story. Because Hong can't effectively tell all the parts of the story that came before her, there is something that Chang calls a helper narrative. Uh, this is a character who worked for the family before Hong was born, and she becomes the storyteller of this time. So a lot of what Hong learns, she learns from this woman who worked for the family. And it's a really effective, narrative technique that gives us, the reader, a lot of history surrounding the family story, but without sort of this info dump of what was going on in the world at the time. And then, as I said before, some of the pieces come from Hong's imagination. So while we have the helper narrator, the point of view of the book is, is really just straightforward and comes from this one narrator. Cheng was using her parents' story in order to craft this one. Her parents did live in China and then moved to Taiwan and the United States, and as she was growing up, they were pretty silent about what had happened to them, and they seemed very mysterious to her. So, like Hong, she used uh, the historical and political context of what was going on in China and Taiwan at that time to sort of piece together their story. And so she's using the backbone of her parents' story, but she's also playing around with some imagined history, like exploring lives that could have happened to people living at that time. And so the book, titled Inheritance, sort of presents this idea of, like, if your inheritance, if the story that you inherit is silent, then what do you do to put that story together? And how much of the inherited story that you get informs who you become? The book that Samantha Chang wrote after Inheritance is called All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost. And this book was written in 2010, and it is vastly different from the stories in Hunger and from Inheritance, which have a lot of the same sort of characters and themes. This 
book takes place at a writer's workshop in a prestigious university that's the university is unnamed. It seems to be perhaps influenced by the Iowa Writers Workshop. And the book is about two students, two men in this program, Romand and Bernard, and they become friends through the writers program. They are very different. They're both poets and Bernard wants to just write poetry for the sake of creating the perfect poem. He has no desire to make money doing this. He lives a life of a very poor poet. Roman, on the other hand, feels like he will only be a great poet when he is validated as the greatest poet. And so it's a lot more about ego for him. And part of the way that he seeks to do this is by getting validation from one of the professors. This workshop that Bernard and Roman are both in is run by Miranda Sturgis, and she is a famous poet, and her class is very renowned at the university. She is aloof. She is highly critical. Um, she's unusual, and students really seek out her approval, and it seems like occasionally she will take a student under her wing or sort of have a more close relationship with one of her students than she does with the general workshop. So Roman's need for validation sends him to Miranda, sends him to Miranda's arms, and ultimately sends him to Miranda's bed. And they have an affair for a long time, and then we see Roman later, years, some years after his graduation. He has a position at a university that he won through his validation and his poetry. He doesn't have an idea of how much Miranda might have influenced this. But when we meet up with him later, he is married to someone who was a student with him in the workshop. So there are periods of life where we don't hear about what is happening to Roman. When we see him as a husband, he's also a father. We don't get the story of him becoming a father. We don't get the story of him getting married. We don't really get the story of the foundations of that or sort of just dropped into it. So Chang was striving to show just periods of time in Roman's life that mattered enormously to him in order to make him this great poet that he imagined he would be. And eventually he does end up winning the Pulitzer, but he it's not for a poem that he feels proud of. So we have this comparison between this poet Bernard who has done this as a calling and maybe creates one perfect poem. And then we have Roman who is much more driven by ego and wants to be validated by the world at large. This book presents something really interesting, which is, can you enjoy a book if you don't like the main character? I think that Roman, in his striving for this validation, and maybe because it just highlights Roman, presents him as a really narcissistic, ego-driven man. And his is really the story that we get mostly. I mean, we see where he frustrates the people around him, the things that they do in reaction to his behaviors are totally understandable based on the way he behaves. He's essentially not very likable, but that doesn't make the book unlikable. And here's the thing about Samantha Chang, which I noticed starting with her stories and then with Inheritance and with All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, is her writing is amazing. And I think you see that initially when you jump into her short stories because they are so condensed. And in a short story, every word has to be chosen with care. And so you're getting this distillation of her beautiful language. And she takes a long time between these books that she publishes. And the result is clearly something that is perfectly crafted. So she can write a book where the main character is unlikable, but the book is really good. And then this brings me to The Family Chow, which was published in 2022. So All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost comes out in 2010. 12 years later, we get The Family Chow. And this is a book that has multiple points of view. There's a father, Leo Chow. He's the patriarch of his family, and he owns and runs a Chinese restaurant in Wisconsin. And he is found dead pretty close to the beginning of the story. And then he has these three sons. Each of the brothers sort of represent a different archetype. We have one who has come back to work in his father's restaurant and really realizes he's a great chef 
and wants to go somewhere with that and perhaps even inherit and take over the restaurant. We have another brother who left completely and is very successful, but doesn't really involve himself with the family at all. And then the youngest brother is the most Americanized. He sort of moderates. He goes between being loyal to either one of those brothers. He's involved with the restaurant, but he's also trying to make a life very much outside of that. And then there are some women who have a grip on Leo. There is his wife, who is the mother of these three sons. And then there is this girlfriend he has um, once his wife moves out. Well, these things might not happen so neatly, but his girlfriend also has a great influence on what happens with the restaurant. There's another mysterious woman who works at the restaurant who we don't really know what her role in all of this is. And so this book is in a lot of ways a murder mystery. We have Leo dead in the beginning of the book. We think he was murdered and the book really sets up the actions that led to his death. We can see how characters are tied to them, but we can kind of see how all the characters are tied to them. So really who is at fault here and who killed Leo and did they do it intentionally? Did they do it to gain hold of the restaurant. So all of these things are sort of unanswered and it creates a book that is very captivating. Part of it is the trial for the murder and it just keeps you really intensely involved because you don't know who is culpable for this. And it kept me guessing until the very end. One way that it's presented very successfully is that it because it is told through multiple points of view, we get chapters from all of these characters. That really helps to create some unreliable narrators, which plant seeds of doubt for us and for the other characters in the book. This book is talking again about the relationship between parents and children and about the relationship between siblings, which is a theme that really comes up in hunger and inheritance. And I read an interview with Chang where she was saying she's really exploring assimilation in, in immigrant families. And that's something she wanted to really delve into with this book is how many generations does it take for a family to feel assimilated? And at what point does an immigrant family stop becoming immigrants? And she feels that maybe once a family comes to this country and that creates ghosts in this country, then there is something that binds them to this country, perhaps more than the country that their family came from. Some of the stories in Hunger deal directly with ghosts. And so you do see this tie, not only to family that's living, but family that's come before you and the hold that that can still have on you, keeping you in a specific place. So I am really glad that I picked up and read The Family Chow because it made me go back and further explore this author's earlier works and her ability to breathe life into her words and create these gems of sentences is so worth your time. It's a real pleasure to read books that are so well crafted. So I recommend that you pick up this new book or one of Lan Samantha Chang's older books. And that is my spotlight on Samantha Chang. Thank you for joining me.